Oh Lord, we give you praise. We give you adoration. My Jesus. <laughs> praise the Lord. God is good. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. God is good. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. I just want to begin by making an announcement that is very critical and very crucial. We cannot be caught with our pants down. Gideon's army had to go through a final test. And that was God tested them with one of the basic necessities of life, quote unquote. You know, because there are certain things that you and I believe that we need. Water is one of them. We think that we have to drink water. I mean, everybody drinks water. Even when you're fasting a marathon fast, for days you still drink water. At least most people do. And God wanted to see if their needs in the natural were more important to them than the battle at hand. You know, the word of God says that no one that is at war and get entangles himself or herself in the affairs of this world. And I'm not just talking about following the NFL on, in an unholy way. I'm not talking about being excessively passionate about news correspondent and the weather. I'm not talking about the frivolities of life. I'm not talking about wanting to go to the cinema all the time and spending all your life on Netflix. But I'm talking about some things that you and I have labeled important. God wants to test you with it to see where your value system lies. And the Bible says God told Gideon, well, let them drink of the water. And this man had been hanging out. They've been away from friends and family. They've been away from home. They've been away from the conveniences of life. At least you would cut them a slack and expect them to have a drink of water. And God was not against them drinking water, but he just wanted to see the attitude with which they drank water. And what did they do? They were lapping on the water like dogs. And God says, those ones who are too concerned about their pleasure, they are not fit to be in this army. God wanted the ones who knew that they needed to drink water, but more than that, that they needed to be sober and to be vigilant. And so we, where did the 300 men come from? The, the, the 300 men in Gideon's army, God's army, where did they come from? They came from amongst those 22,000 men who were there, but they were the ones who knelt down on one knee and had their hands on their sword ready just in case anything happens. And so the announcement really that I've come to make today is that we need to be ready. The word of God says we need to be sober and we need to be vigilant. We need to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches and the moves that he is making. Because God does not always lead us by what things he says. Sometimes he leads us by the moves that he makes. And someone says, oh, but God always speaks. Yes, he always speaks, but it's not every time that he leads you by speaking to you. Imagine how frustrated you will be as a parent if you have to tell your children everything. Imagine how frustrating that will be if you have to tell them when there are guests around, if you have to spell everything to them. I will be frustrated, but just that one time, because after that, they will get the message. I just want to be able to give them the look. And then they know that, okay, yeah, time to shut up. I want to give them the look. And let them know, time to get up. Time to go to my room. You see what I mean? And that is how God leads us. The children of Israel did not know that, but God ta he taught them. Because there were times when God was moving, the cloud was moving. And they were like, okay. There were times when the cloud wasn't moving, and they just got tired of sitting down, and they wanted to move. And they always paid for it. And so they learned to move when God is moving. Not just when he has spoken, but when they see what he's doing in the heavens. So where we have come to is a time where in vigilance and being observant, which is what that word means, to be vigilant means to be observant and to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing is at an all-time high. The need for that is at an all-time high. We cannot afford to be insensitive to what God is doing. Take for example what happened in here today. Just before the meeting started, maybe at about maybe 6.30 or so, my wife came to me and she said to me, the Lord showed me people slain in the spirit into this service. 
And look at what happened. We haven't even officially, at least by our own schedule, started the meeting. On Sunday, my sister Andrea, she said to me, she said, oh, I'm coming early to, to pray. She said, because God has shown me that that is my place. And so she was like, I'm going to be here for this Tuesday. I'm going to be praying before service. And she came in here praying before service. Ryan came, he was on his face. And before you knew what was going on, pretty much everybody that walked into the room was diving onto the stage. Coming right here. We may not have a raised podium here, but I've seen podiums that are raised higher than me without the presence of God. And it's nothing but just an uphill battle that is uncalled for. It is just a trap for people to stumble and fall. You understand what I mean? Have you not seen one of those stages? You go from one step to another and you get up there just so that the light can shine in your face, but it's nothing but the LED light, not the light of God's glory. But we come in here and it's the same level that everybody stands on, but when God puts his presence in a place, it is, non, it is undeniable. And one of the things that we have seen again and again is that the presence of God is here with us. Now, what is that presence of God there for? Is he there just so that you can tell your friends that, oh, there's this basement that we go to and the presence of God is there. Yes, you should tell people. Because Jesus expects for you, like the apostles, to go and tell others that they have seen the Messiah. But it is not just so that we can tell. It is also so that we can lay hold of what is in God's presence. Because let me tell you something, everything that we need is in the water. And the water is in his presence. And so I want to encourage you, let us heighten our sensitivity to the things of the Spirit. Let us be more sensitive because you just never know when this kind of presence will be in your home and God wants you to dive into it. God does not expect for you to leave that presence behind and be chasing shadows and be getting occupied with things that do not edify. So let us make that commitment within us. You know, there's a lot of messages and warnings that I've been leading up onto this time. But we have come to a time wherein we need to have our eyes open, our discernment sharp, and some of us need to have our eyes closed. Because if your eyes have been open to the wrong things, then it's time for you to close your eyes to those things that your eye in the spirit might lead you to where God would have you be. I just want to say this prayer real quick just before we go on. And this prayer is coming. Actually, let me explain the prayer before I say it. On Sunday, the Lord showed certain things to me and I didn't say it all. But I'm going to say more of it today. You know when I told you that some people were not well dressed and they were not equipped? The Lord showed me that a lot of the people who were told to fall out of line and go back into their tents were people who had excessively pleased themselves. They pleasured themselves to the point wherein their bodies received more than they needed. And that was where the excrements came from. Okay, so let's get a little graphic here. Because sometimes if we don't know how serious it is, we don't know that God is talking about us. And we don't make the move that is needed to remedy the situation through the act, through, through the act of repentance. And he said to me that while they were supposed to be preparing to stand in line as soldiers of the cross, they kept on looking for the pleasures of life, for the sweet things of life. And that was what ran their belly and that was what made the mess. And the Lord said to me that in the tent where they go, there is still more temptation. But they need to learn how to resist. Does it make sense now what I was saying on Sunday about the fact that there are many voices waiting for you in the tent? The tent is where the Lord is asking you to go to prepare. Just like he put the man in the garden to prepare to take over the world. But in the garden, there were many voices. The voice of God was there. The voice of the man himself was there. The voice of the woman was there. The voice of the serpent was there. There are so many voices between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 3. You have pretty much all the voices that determine the decisions that you make. But if you don't know what those voices are for, then you're not going to respond accordingly. And so in the tent that you go, the radio is on and many channels are being broadcast at the same time as God is calling us to pull back, to fall out of line temporarily to prepare by repenting and making ourselves ready to be cleansed by the Lord. God is saying you need to identify the voices and you need to respond accordingly. One of the voices that I didn't mention on Sunday which I am mentioning today is that the ground has a voice. Remember that when Abel was slaughtered by Cain, the Bible says, I have, God said, I have heard the voice 
of the ground and it was not just the ground but it was also the blood of your brother that was crying out of the ground and so many of us will hear the voices of blood we're going to hear the voices of the things that we have done now the reason why the Lord would not have me share it on Saturday on Sunday is not being made clear to me I'm going to say that and then we're going to pray and then you can sit down on Sunday I was just going to tell you about the voice of blood that some of the things that you have done will come and be brought up in this season so that you can deal with it right not just so that it can deal with you the voice of the blood of Abel dealt with Cain because God came God gave Cain an opportunity to deal with that voice right before the Lord but he didn't and the voice dealt with him a judgment that he could not have escaped from so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples you see what was the blood of Abel the blood of Abel was the life of another man that was crying out because of what you have done many of us there are people that we have held in unforgiveness whose bloods are crying out to God do you know how many people go to the presence of God and they cannot offer their sacrifices because you have something against them Jesus said to his disciples he says when you come before the presence of the Lord and you know that someone has a thing against you now I'm not talking about the fact that you have something against them but you know you know quite often we know people who have things against us your, your inner sense is telling you something isn't right. Whether you think you did right or wrong, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the fact that he wants you to do what the Father expects, which is to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Jesus says, leave your offering at the altar and then go and make peace with your brother. So do you know that there are people who have gone before the presence of the Lord and they cannot go through because of what you have, because of the fact that you have something against them and their offerings and sacrifices are crying to God. And God is saying, what are you going to do about it? He gave Cain an opportunity to do something about it. But Cain says, no, I'm not going to do it. I do not take responsibility for my brother. That's his problem. That was what he says. He says, am I my brother's keeper? Because that's what we say. I don't care what you think about me. That's your problem. If you have something against me, how is that my problem? What you're literally saying to God is, am I my brother's keeper? What we need to do is we need to give that person an opportunity to know how important they are to us and how important they are to God by going to them to make peace. Now, once you have gone and you have found someone else to go with you in case they resist you the first time, Jesus says you're off the hook. But you have to take those two steps. Go to them. If they reject you, find another person to go with you. Let me tell you something. Because where we have come to right now, the everlasting doors are opening up. The king of glory is about to come. Don't deny yourself a place in line to receive him because of the things that you are holding against other people and what they are holding against you. I could have said all of that on Sunday, but I didn't. But now I know why, because the Lord showed me the rest of that message this afternoon. And you know what the rest of the message is? The Lord said to me that some of us, we are the ones that we have things against. Let me say that again. Some of us present here, we are our own enemies. We are holding ourselves in unforgiveness. You haven't forgiven yourself for those mistakes that you have made, especially the ones that you kept repeating. You haven't forgiven yourself. This was the way the Lord showed it to me. I saw a man who was standing before judgment. And I heard the promise of God was trumpeted. It was such a loud declaration that says every tongue that rises against this man in judgment shall be condemned. And suddenly the man was condemned. And I was like, wait a minute. The promise says every tongue that rises against this man in judgment shall be condemned. How come the man himself got condemned? And the Lord said to me because he kept speaking against himself. In that tent that God is asking you to go to for restoration and repentance, you're not going to be mute. Even you are still speaking. Even you will hear your voice. What is your own voice saying? about you is your voice condemning you is your voice accusing you you know we always say this thing that oh I know myself that's what I keep doing 
okay and god is saying well this time around no one is even accusing you you're accusing yourself and so let me just say these seven things very quickly and then we're going to pray thing number one you have to be determined to go wherever the lord is leading you to make peace this season because the coming of the lord is close and when i'm talking about the coming of the lord i'm not just talking about the end of the world let me tell something the world can end i don't care what i care about is the coming like i keep saying it is not what is coming that bothers me it is who is coming that concerns me because all of what is coming is only pointing to who is coming you know but the world is going to make noise about what is coming but you need to know who is coming you know the bible says the night comes oh yes i get it the night is coming let it come but the one that is going to come in the cover of the night who says i come as a thief in the night is the one that i'm interested in so my preparation is for the one that is coming let me use that opportunity to make a clarification my wife said to me today she said you have to explain yourself you told people to store food and water for two weeks but you're also telling them to do nothing but stand and wait on michael the archangel of the lord okay so let me explain because some of you are like okay so which one do we do do we prepare or do we stop i said something on sunday and i'm thinking y'all missed it what did i say what i said was this i said having done all to stand stand don't stand until you have done all to stand what i'm saying is having done all to stand stand not in fear because when you're afraid you cannot stand when people are afraid they're nervous they keep pacing back and forth no having done all to stand stand and let the lord by his angel fight the battle okay so all of the instructions that you have read brother travis can i ask you to stand up and the reason why i'm asking you to stand up is because there is a cloud over this place and I want your head in it. As many of us as can't stand up, let us be standing at this particular moment. Okay, because I don't want you to miss it. So that's thing number one, right? You have to be ready to go wherever the Lord leads you to make peace. Now, there is a rain that is coming upon the earth and that is thing number two. That rain will wash many away. But that rain should not wash you away. And the only way by which the rain will not wash you away is if you do not resist the Lord. If you do not what? Resist the Lord. Now, it's different from the first thing I said. The first thing I said is you, should be, you must be willing and ready to go wherever the Lord leads. And then the second thing, very similar to it, is when the Lord is leading and you get to that place, whatever he tells you to do, do not resist. The Lord will ask you to reach out to some people. The Lord will ask you to undo certain things that you have done to yourself. Do not resist. Do not say, well, I don't think I need to do anything else. I mean, you just asked me to come here and I have come here. No, go the extra mile. Do not resist the Lord. The third and the fourth thing, I want you to listen very carefully because they're not the easiest things to do, but they are going to be easy for you this time around. In fact, I already said that they've been made easy. This season, pray. This season, fast. This season, do what? Pray this season fast because you need the oil it's gonna be easy this time I mean it's been easy of late and so if you have not yet adopted fasting in your life adopt fasting Jesus is not coming for people that have been feasting He's coming for people that have been waiting so if you feast now you will miss out the feast when he comes but if you fast now you will be a part of his feast can we repeat the four things you must be willing to go where the lord leads when you get there no matter what he tells you to do do not resist number three thing you pray this season number four thing you fast this season the fifth thing i'm going to skip it because you have to understand six or seven before you understand number five the sixth thing that you have to do in this season is i said it last week but i don't think people understood what i said you need to start to recognize how important you are okay every one of us we need to recognize how important we are if if jesus is coming all the way for us there must be something special about us we have to undo all the lies of the enemy that just says that you're a taxpayer that says you're just that social security number you are not just that credit score or that passport that is in your hand you are god's investment on the earth and let me tell you something about praise the lord there is a kind of humility that god calls false humility oh i'm nothing i am just a man 
But what does it mean to be a man? You are made in the image and in the likeness of God. Begin to see yourself as important. You know why that is important? Do you know that quite often the people who are more highly placed in an organization are the ones who make the most sacrifices? When you listen to the stories, most CEOs miss a lot of their children's growing up. Simply because every time they think about the fact that they are that important to that business, to that organization, it's easier for them to make those sacrifices. They will miss that party because of the fact that it's either you go to the party, make a couple of children laugh, or or your business disappears. Now, that is the worldly way of doing it. But I use that example because you and I need to start to see ourselves as important in the scheme of things so that we are more willing to sacrifice the things of this world that may easily beset us. Kenyatta, if you know that God has a place in his army for you and a particular weapon that nobody else is equipped to use but you, are you going to sit at home when the battle cry is being called? Or would you already have been there ahead of the battle cry, oiling your machine? We need to ask, some of us need to beg God in repentance to say, God, I am sorry for having diminished myself, for having sat down with the pigs to eat when in fact I am a son of the kingdom. We need to repent from dead works. We need to repent from how we have belittled the image of God, particularly those of us who are the new creation in Christ Jesus. That is thing number five. No, no, that's thing number six. I told you I was going to skip number five. Number six is you have to recognize, and it's not a coincidence because six is the number of man. Not the fallen man, but man made in the image and in the likeness of God. And thing number seven is this. You see, the moment you begin to recognize that you're important, you know what it also helps you to do? It helps you to serve other people. Because that other person is important too. Sarah is as important as John is simply because God did not make any extra tires. So you don't exist in the kingdom just in case Ryan fails. So God did not make Eli just in case he's like, in case Ryan doesn't deliver, I'm going to have myself a backup. You understand what I mean? Every single one of us, we have our uniqueness. And so the moment you begin to realize yours, don't stop there move to the next level which is to begin to see other people as important let me tell you something one of the reasons why i find it easy to forgive people and to overlook things is because i'm not just looking at what people are doing i allow god to show me their potential and how important they are in the scheme of things and all i want to do is aid you to get there because if you're missing there on the day we're in trouble because no one is going to fill your place We need every soldier, we need every hand on deck, we need every man. We need every operator of the machinery of God's kingdom here on earth. We need everybody. You see what I mean? And Jesus demonstrated this to us by begging the Father. Jesus was pleading the Father. He was pleading with the Father that look, all of these ones that you have given to me, none shall be lost. We can only afford one casualty, and that is the son of perdition. And what Jesus was saying is, the only reason why I'm I'm willing to let go of this one is because he was made for destruction. The word perdition there is the word Apollyon, which is destruction. And so Jesus was saying, if not that we need for somebody to destroy this facade, to betray me, even this one, I'm not ready to let go of him. And so that is the way we need to plead for one another. In the place of intercession. Now the reason why I skipped number five. Is because if you don't know that you're important. And if you don't know that the other person is important. How then will you know the place of the Holy Spirit? Many of us diminish the the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The reason why God has assigned you the Holy Spirit is because you need him. The reason why he's assigned you the Holy Spirit is because of the fact that there is something about you that can only be powered by the wind of heaven. So number five is you need to renew your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need to renew that interaction with the Holy Spirit and make sure that you don't go a day without finding out what is on his mind because what is on his mind is what is on the mind of your heavenly father. Otherwise, you and I can spend all of eternity completely preoccupied by foolishness because Satan can make sure of that. 
but we need to know what is in the heart of the Father. And so this is the prayer that the Lord will have me say to you. The Lord will have me say this to you, that you will know your time in this season. And I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, that the eye of your understanding will be open to recognize the time that we have come to, the season that we are in, because the moment your, your, your spiritual senses embrace the situation, from God's perspective, everything that is on the inside of you that is of God will begin to wake up. Everything that is on the inside of you will begin to wake up. Your eggs will hatch once you know the time that you're in. Once you know that the time has come for you to begin to manifest the glory of God, you will rise up and that light will shine. I pray for there to be a spiritual, a supernatural awareness of the time that we're in. Let it fall upon each and every one of us this moment in the mighty name of Jesus. Let it come upon each and every one of us. Know your season, communion house. Know your season, daughters of Zion. Know your season, sons and soldiers of the cross. Know your season. Know your season. Marando shendeli ya boko dori abala. Iye le bala, hushanda li ya ye bala. Uye le bala, muskunda li ya da baba. You will be willing to go where he leads. You will not resist him when you get there. You are your brother's keeper. You will make the sacrifices that are needed. My Jesus. Marando ayela mosa. You will pray. You will fast. You will lean on the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. We're going to go over the seven things one more time. And then we're going to, we're going to sit down and then, and then continue. So please, I just want you to look at me one more time. Number one thing, be willing to go back into the tent. And when I say back into the tent, for those of you who may not be familiar, you can watch the message from last week and from two weeks before. I've been talking about this tent meeting and how God has been preparing his people for battle. But some people standing in line have been soiled by all manners of excessive pleasure seeking and seeking vengeance when the Lord has not brought vengeance. Seeking to satisfy themselves when the Lord is saying, wait upon me. And every one of those mess that we have made, we need to go in the tent and be cleansed of it. But recognize that there are voices in the tent and you need to know what to do with those voices. When it is the voice of the Lord, submit to it. When it is your own voice, judge and make sure that you're speaking in unison with what the word of God says. When it is the voice of Satan, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When it's the voice of blood or the voice of the ground crying out, be reminded that you are your brother's keeper and be repentant and be ready to make peace. Be ready to go back in that tent where God is working on you. And that tent is not a physical place. I'm not saying move back to the old house where you used to live. I'm just saying that as the Lord is calling you to that repentance, humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord. Number one thing, be willing. Number two thing is no matter what it is that God tells you to do, after you have found yourself in that attitude of soberness before the Lord, do not resist. Do not take back the submission that you have brought before the Lord. Number three thing, what do you do? You pray. Number four, you fast. Number five, you acquaint yourself once again with the one that's been called alongside the Holy Spirit. Talk to him and he will speak back to you. He's already speaking to you. When you talk to him, it just enables you to hear him. And what is number six? Number six thing is tell yourself that you are important. You are the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. There is a place in the army that is yours to occupy and you need to take and we're going to do an exercise in here today god revealed to you what you were seeing the lord revealed to me a month ago that we all need to take uh, be conscious of the hour of the day that god has put in your heart to pray you understand what i mean pastor will get ready we're going to give out the pieces of paper as soon as people sit down and then i'm going to explain some more but every single one of us and i've carried this exercise out i've tested it and it works every one of us standing here today there is an hour of the day that god has already programmed into you which is your hour of praying everybody has their own hour simply because god will not appoint us as watchmen to the tower without giving us a schedule he's not that kind of leader he knows what he's doing now, can I prove that to you? Jesus had been praying on his own and he never bothered anybody. The same Jesus who never rode anywhere. Jesus walked everywhere and he took his time. There were times when people said, Jesus, hurry up. And he says, no, I'm not hurrying up. I'm going to take my time. They said, well, your friend is dying. He says, let him die. I am not going anywhere. The only time we saw Jesus riding a donkey was when he was heading to the cross. And that is the attitude God wants every one of us to have, to be willing to lay it all down.
no matter what it takes okay so your christianity is about to take flight now it's about to move quickly because all that mess that we were doing is religion but right now we're racing to the finish line if it is the guillotine we're racing to it if it is prosecution not just persecution we're racing to it because one way or the other we need to finish our assignment and we need to finish it the way jesus finished his with all willingness to surrender some of you some of us will not have to face any prosecution some of us will not have to face any guillotine but every one of us need to be willing to if it comes so don't be partially willing and say i'm still praying silently that i will not be persecuted <laughs> but god i'm willing no 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 if you're truly willing don't give it out just yet i want people to hear these things again so we got the number six which is know your place and so today we are going to write down the hour that is in our hearts when we get there i'll tell you how to find it and so jesus that same jesus he has always prayed on his own without bothering anybody but when he was in the garden of gethsemane what did he say to his disciples he says watch with me an hour and god will not ask you to bring what he has not given you because he's not raising a generation of thieves so whatever God is asking you to bring is because he has already given it to you. When he says bring a sacrifice, it's because he's already given to you. When he says bring a tenth, it's because he gave you the hundred in the first place. He's not going to ask you to give. When he says, oh, go and sacrifice your son Isaac. He didn't say that before Isaac was born. He didn't say that before Isaac was ready. He said it because he gave it. You understand what I mean? And so whatever it is that God is asking you to give, he already gave it to you. So if he's saying, watch with me, an hour, there is an hour that is your hour before the presence of God. And so whenever there is a gathering in the presence of God for intercession, your name is called, and most of us were always absent. But we can't do that anymore because now <laughs> the battle is about to begin. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about where we're at, you know. Ryan sent me a message and it was like, I've been seeing things in the spirit. He said, but this one that I saw, he was so real, right? He felt like he was so real in a different way. You're right on the money and I'll tell you why in just a little bit. But what is thing number seven? Thing number seven is you need to attribute the same significance that you are becoming aware of to your brothers and sisters, right? We need Eli. We need him to wake up and take his place. And so as much as I am thanking God for my destiny, I need to pray for the fulfillment of his destiny. Because if we're not connected like that, as the chains that are, as chains that are connected, let me tell you something, we cannot pull anything down. We have to stay connected, preferring one another. Let me tell you something, this is one of the lessons that the apostles did not learn at the beginning of their ministry. But go and look at their lives and read their epistles. By the time they were advanced in the fulfillment of their assignment, they started to prefer others before them. And Apostle Paul said it many times. He said, prefer others before you. Let others come before you. Simply because the honor that, the honor that you give is the honor that you have. And so when you don't know how to honor people, then you don't have any honor yourself. So begin to honor people. Begin to pray for people like you truly believe that they're important. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Those are the seven things. Let us be seated. Today, by the grace of God, actually, let's do this piece of paper thing before I forget. So let's let everybody take a piece of paper. We had a leaders meeting about a couple of weeks ago and I said I asked Charlotte just randomly the Lord already told me that her hour of prayer is 9 a.m. but I kept it to myself and I asked her just randomly I'm like what is that hour of prayer that hour that you know in your heart that you should be praying and she said 9 a.m. and so I know that we know even though some of us our flesh is telling us bless you you're not going to get out of this you will write your hour of prayer there is some of us will resist because your spirit is telling you 2 a.m and you're like <laughs> that's not going to happen 
I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, that the voice of obedience and the voice of the Spirit will be louder than the voice of the flesh in here today. One thing that the Holy Spirit said to me, he said by the time we get all the papers back, all the hours on the clock will be covered. Even with the people in this room. Every single hour of the day is going to be covered. If each and every one of us will stay true to the voice that is in our hearts. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, write. Where's my piece of paper? I want to pray too. I want you to do me a favor. We'll really go upstairs very quickly. No, I, I, want, I want a different pen. We'll go upstairs. You know my drawer that is above the trash in the kitchen? There is a blue pen. I want you to bring that pen. Now, I want you to write, write your hour of the day. For some of you, you know very well it was that very first hour that came to your mind. So don't question it. Don't debate it. Don't try to remember your schedule. And what time the game comes on. And yeah. So you've been drinking. You've been lapping with everything. And God is saying no. I don't want people who are all about pleasure. I want people who are ready to stand as soldiers of the cross. And we're just going to wait until Will comes back. Because I want to write mine too. Thank you. Now this pen came in. And it had the name communion house on it. And I was like I was just going to toss it out. And the Lord said to me to keep it. Now I'm going to write this and the significance of that is that this hour of the day is very special to Communion House. Okie dokie. Alrighty. So Katie's going to pass out the, um, the jar. the jar. And so what's that other piece of paper in the jar? Don't let it confuse anybody. That's yours, this big one. Are you praying for two hours? No, it's just, it's just part of the jar. Oh, okay. Let's take that one out of the jar. Just want the hours of prayer in the jar. Alrighty, thank you. No, don't worry. You're not praying for two hours. Don't be scared. Everybody's an hour. So let us put all of that in the bowl. No, no, no names. No names. Just your hour. Oh, yeah. You, so can, you can put your name in there. And we can hold you accountable. We can test you and, and just call you with that hour of the day and see if you pick up. And see where you're at. <laughs> But I want you to remember what you have written. Okay? So where is Anne? Anne, what did you tell us Tuesday last week? Remember that I said that in three weeks from three Sundays ago, that something is going to happen of great significance in the world and that we need to be aware. Did you remind us on Tuesday that it was going to be this Sunday that just passed? Right? And I said that a week after the Lord had revealed to you that it would be in a month. Right? And how many people remember that around that time I kept quoting the scripture that says there is war in the heavens. You remember that? Very good. Can you show us that video, Will? So I took a, I did a screen recording of a news. Because I don't, I don't watch TV. I don't listen to the news. But every now and again, whatever I need to know, I know. It will just come. And so today I was minding my business. And the Lord led me to go sit where my phone was. And just within a little while, this notification came into my phone. And Will and Katie will help us to project it onto the screen. Onto the screen. So this is a global scale event that happened this last Sunday. Okay, before we show it, did anybody else look out this Sunday to see if they will find what it is that was prophesied? And did you find anything? You found nothing. Did anybody at least try did anybody try? Eli, you tried? And you found nothing. What did you think it might be before they showed this one? Don't, don't show it just yet. What did you find? Whatever you, what they were doing at the climate change, something uh, very close, but not, not the one. Anybody else? Oh, hit me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I saw, I saw that one too. I saw that one too. That, that's been ongoing for a couple of years, which is the... So you know who the Titans are. How many people have seen the, the class of the Titans? And how many people have read the story? You know that a lot of that which they present to us as fiction or mythology is actually in our history as, as, as children of God. Because when the, when, the, when the sons of God, 
the watchers when they fell to the, to, to the earth and by falling, what, the way God sees it and the reason why it's called falling is because they left their original estate so that they can sleep with the daughters of men and children were born to them that were called the giants and the men of renown of their time. What was the judgment? The judgment that God passed on them was that those children will fight one another to the death in the presence of their fathers. Because that is the greatest pain that anybody can know to see their children kill one another. And I established that that was the greatest pain because Isaiah prophesied that Jesus will come and will be made subject to the greatest pain, which will be the pain of the sins of the world. And what was that pain that Jesus went through that was the father's pain? Jesus, being a seed of Abraham, was crucified by the other seeds of Abraham. So Jesus was crucified by his siblings. And that was why God's heart was so broken to the fact that he was so grieved he couldn't speak. When Jesus was calling out for help, the father was there, but it was, it was just too much pain, right? And so that was the judgment of the ones who fell, whose children had to clash with one another. And they were half God, half human. And that was why you, you, that's why you find all of these things in all of these mythology talking about the clash of the titans. Now, the titans are back because they were in prison for a little bit in Tartarus. Now... This information is not for everybody, okay? Let me start to make myself clear. When I am teaching, not everything I'm saying is for you, okay? I am very elitist in my teaching. And someone is like, wow, it's, it's, for, it's supposed to be for everybody. It is only for you if you have been looking for those answers. The Bible says he knows who follows to know. If in your quest for the things of God, you haven't asked those questions, they are not for you. Maybe in two months, they will be for you when you're listening to the messages. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I find quite often people are like, but I, I don't understand what you just said. That doesn't even make sense. I used to not say things that I feel like majority of the people may not get. But then the Lord said to me, no, but there are some of your brothers and sisters who have been asking those questions, who have been seeking to know, you have to share with them. And so when I'm talking, when I'm saying some of these things, if it's going over your head, it's okay. But it's not okay if you just let it go forever. Let it challenge you to start to find out exactly what these things mean. So it is for everybody, but at this moment, it is only for the people who have been asking those questions. Because quite often I'm throwing all of these things out, I'm throwing these things out. And I'm explaining that today because there is something in today's message that I'm going to be throwing out as the Lord allows, because he already showed it to me, that is only for the people who have been asking. So if you're one of those people, just take it to yourself and then go work on it. And then eventually, yeah, eventually some of the other people will catch up with it it's okay because look we're not racing against one another each one of us we are on the path that God has set for us and we will get there eventually you understand what I mean so I just thought I'll give that disclaimer so that you don't feel like oh I don't understand this one yeah someone else is getting it and eventually you will all right and so the class of the titans that is what it is now I was talking about the fact that some people have made their escape from Tartarus for those of you that have been looking into those things, they are responsible for the overdrive that the earth is on right now. Because they originally came from an advanced civilization called heaven, and they're trying to drive the earth at such a pace that the earth is not made for. And so there's going to be a burnout. And someone is like, oh, but why would God allow that? Because God needs the earth to burn out anyway, because the new has to come. And so they're doing the will of the Father, even though they may not be in obedience to the Father. Does it make sense? Because everything does the will of God. Whether you, whether you like it or not, you do the will of God. The Bible says, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and is to come, who is worthy to receive all the glory, all the honor, all the power, because he has created all things for, your, for his pleasure. They are and were created. Even Satan does the will of God when he doesn't know he is. Famous example, Job chapter 1. There was a meeting of the sons of God and Lucifer was present. And God asked him, hey, you, what's been going on? And he says, no, nothing, which was not true. You see what I mean? Because he told God, he said he's not been doing anything. Whereas he has been busy. And he says, and God says, well, if you are telling me you're not busy, I'll give you work to do. 
he said have you considered my servant job so all that persecution all that which the devil was doing taking away all of the things in the life of job satan was working for god because god looked at job and loved him so dearly and wanted to bless him double but job was holding on to his current blessings the bible says that job was so desperate not to lose what he already had and god was like come on i want to give you more such that even his children he didn't want to lose them the bible says that job will fast and pray for his children so that their hearts would not turn against the lord and he was afraid that he would lose his belongings and he would pray and he was holding on to those things and god was like look 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 i want to give you more and that was why he assigned satan to force those things out of his hands to make room for double do you think satan thought for a moment that he was doing the will of god oh no. but at the end of the day who was glorified god when judas betrayed jesus do you think he did it because it was the will of god he did it for the duty he did it for the money right but guess what he was doing the will of god when the children of abraham crucified jesus in fact the bible says that when caiaphas the high priest remember caiaphas nicole they were waiting for him to give the final word and what did he say when they came to him he said you know what it is better for one to die than for all to die so we're going to crucify jesus he thought he was saying that because the bible says he said those things to those people as they conspired that they may present a case to pontius pilate to please him who himself was concerned that there will not be an upheaval of the people to upset the roman state they were conspiring for their own political and religious interests but the bible by the holy spirit it was inserted in scripture that even Caiaphas who spoke out of his conspiracy was speaking by the Holy Spirit being high priest that year the Bible says even him he was speaking the will of God because of his position as high priest that year when the believers were persecuted in Jerusalem Acts chapter 4 verse 26 Peter says that was what the hand of God had planned and what his voice and his words have ordained how do we know that because if they were not persecuted in jerusalem they would not have gone to the ends of the earth they would have become local champions forever it was persecution that drove them to the ends of the earth when the romans were killing people in the in the in the thousands do you think he caught God by surprise? No, God was like, look, the, I need these Romans. They're very desperate and determined. I need them to penetrate the entire world and build roads so that the missionaries can travel to the ends of the earth. Do you know that most places where the gospel went to, the Romans went first? Anyway, I say all of that to let you know that the sovereignty of God is such that every single one of us present in here, whether we like it or not, we will do the will of God. So do yourself a favor and just cooperate with him so that you can enjoy the process. Now, so yes. Okay, yeah, just stay right there for a moment. I want to encourage you. All that rant was because when I said in three weeks, something is going to happen and somebody else confirmed it my desire and god's desire will be for each and every one of us to be on the lookout the bible says watch and pray we should have that desire within us to see the fulfillment of prophecy unless we don't believe that god is speaking here at communion house but if we believe we should be on the lookout only two people who are three raised their hands to say that they were on the lookout communion house we can do better let us let us be on the lookout to see what our heavenly father is doing because the signs and the wonders are for us so that we don't miss our season this was sunday last week can you play that video uh oh can it be clearer than that because nobody can read what it's what he's saying is there well a reason why we have that resolution looking like that maybe you can zoom in your phone okay will what about you can you do any better than that okay anyway no no they got it let's all just make sure that we give them enough time to sort it out okay let's try this one okay what let me do let me let me send you a picture maybe if you can just project the picture maybe that would help us I, I want everybody to be able to read this and know what is really going on in the world which one of you do I send it to 
Okay. Um, okay, Katie, I'm sending this to you. So when you get that picture, just project that picture. And this happened only on Sunday. On Tuesday, Anne reminded us, she said, oh, it's going to be this Sunday that just passed two days ago. Okay, let's wait. Let's wait. It is important for you to read it so that you can know what exactly is going on in the world. My hope is that we begin to take things a bit more seriously because the time is short. I keep saying the time is short, not because I want to scare you into selling off your business and, and taking all your money from the bank and going to Disney one more time. No, that's not why. Those are not the things that we're supposed to do when the time is short. When the time is short, what do we do? We work the work of him who has sent us. It is to allow us to focus on the things that matter. Okay, so while Katie is being technologically challenged, let me see if I can... Are you almost there? My phone's lost signal. Your phone's lost signal. What about Will? Alrighty. Okay, at this point, I'm going to have to read this thing out to everybody. Because if these people cannot make it happen, don't worry, we've had this situation before where we're having been resisted. But it's okay. They can resist us, but we will fight back. Alrighty. What is this TV called again? How do you normally, how do you guys normally project so to it? To it's not, it's not oh, you have to go through Google. Okay, never mind. I didn't know because Google is, uh, has been under attack in the last um, 12 hours or so. You know, I've been talking about the darkness that is coming and it's going to be a darkness of technology. You saw how Facebook was out and all their services. Google was out today. And when Google went out, Snapchat went with it. Some part of Twitter went with it. A lot of things went out with it. Now, these outages are not, um, they're like test outages, okay? And I've said this before that these things are test outages, but let me now tell you the reason why these test outages are going on and why we need to be concerned now that we're about to move past the test into the real thing. Project back that image again, whichever one that you can project, put it back on the screen, and I'm going to see if I can read it to you here, and then you can visually try to match what you're seeing. The Bible says, I said the Bible says, the news. There we go. Okay, good. Okay, just pause it. Well, let's read. Katie, don't be too excited. Let's pause it where it's at. I want us to see. Go back to the beginning. Okay, and as soon as it's clear, you pause it. Okay, pause it right there. Okay, what does it say? It says 16th November. 2021 when is that today alrighty now it says why the next war will be fought where in space. in space what is the prophecy of John it says there was war where in the heavens right war in the heavens now you may not see very clearly but these people they know what they're doing because they also have to communicate to their goons who are in different parts of the world who rely on this mass communication to know what's going on. And so they have depicted three levels of heavens here. This is one. You can see this arch. That is one. And then you can see that second heaven. The war is taking place where? Where do you see the explosion? The explosion is where? You see the spark here? In the second heavens. And in the boundary of the first and the second heavens. The Bible says there will be war in the heavens. Now, when the people who wrote the Bible wrote the Bible, they were speaking in dark sayings because there's no way they could have comprehended what they were saying because it takes thousands of years of human civilization for people to be able to comprehend things like this. But now the children of this world are announcing to us that they're getting ready for the next war and it's going to be a war in where? In the heavens. They said it's going to be fought in space. So if they said if a major superpower were to erupt and the drums have been recently been beaten, been beating both on the farthest, farthest reaches of Eastern Europe as well as the South China Sea. 
when you know your geography, you know that the central location to those two places is where? Is where the king of the north is. Is Gog and Magog, Russia. Okay? So, let me, let, me, let me just explain this to you. You see, because we don't have time as believers, we have been so dumbed down by the world. We need to speed up our thinking. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. We need to come up higher. Because the people that we're fighting against have been schooling their children for 5,000 years for this battle. They made reference to 5,000 years of preparation here, but they called it five days. Don't be fooled. They mean 5,000 years. Okay, now let's go. They said between, the, the, between Eastern Europe and the South China Sea, when you plot those two on the map, the center of those two coordinates is where the king of the north is. Gog and Magog is where? Is Russia. Okay? And so, but they, they will actually tell you in a minute. So don't just take my words for it. They said the new battlefield is not just going to be Pearl Harbor, like World War II. Or some kind of naval or air base. Though so this wants to be targeted too, it will be in space. This is the reason why I said it that as the Lord revealed to me, that in three weeks, and exactly three weeks from that Sunday, this happened. The signal for the war in the heavens has already begun. And the implications of that will result into darkness upon the earth. Alan, you remember that vision that you saw? That the, op the heavens were open? How many heavens did you see? You saw two. You saw the first heaven and then you saw another heaven once that sky opened. And the moment the sky opened, darkness fell upon the earth. When Alan said, show, say, may share that vision with me. I said, do you know why there was darkness? I said, because the lights, the stars, the, the sun, the moon, they are embedded in the firmament. So when you roll out the firmament, there will be darkness. That darkness is not just darkness of the night sky is what the darkness of the people it's going to result in the darkness of technology okay so let me keep let us keep going and then you will see these three things that i've mentioned russia the darkness of technology the war in the heavens you see more let's go satellites satellites will stop working screens will go blank military communications will break down for the person in the street, Google Maps will stop working. And at home, Alexa will stop replying to you. But actually, war in space is already underway. Jesus says there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. Towards the end of his ministry, he says, walk in the day and you will not stumble when the darkness comes. That's why they're referring to the person in the street. The person in the street will stumble because the darkness is coming. And what is this darkness? It is the darkness of the people. It's going to be an impact on technology. Have I said this before here? Ryan can almost tell us how many times I've said it. If you listen to the messages and the teachings, I have been saying it, that the darkness is coming. That is the reason why you cannot rely on the conveniences that you have been used to. You and I need to learn how to stay in the presence of God and how to begin to use a spiritual antenna to receive from God and to communicate with others. These things are about to be taken away and they're fighting war in the heavens. Now, I am not just, but I'm thankful to God for the prophetic insight that he gives to me but what some of you don't know is I spent years working in satellite communications. The Lord schooled me in satellite communications across multiple countries. And even in this country, I've been given access by the grace of God and privilege to where the most sophisticated and most advanced satellite of the U.S. military is located. And till today, it is inexplicable how I got into that place. If I, when I came out, I told my wife and I told my brother, I said, if not that the word of prophecy had come forth, even myself would not believe that it just let me into that place and answered my questions and showed me things that eyes haven't seen about four years ago. But you know what happened? A year before that, a man of God came into this town and I volunteered to go and serve him and wait on his hand. And you know what he said to me? He said, I see you in a military base. And what he described was exactly where these satellites are being kept. So when I see things like that, my mind is exploding because I know how satellite communications affect pretty much everything we do that we call technology today. 
don't just talk about the fact that we have we know i know that we've got transatlantic cables there are cables that are under the ocean that connect certain things but a lot of what is used to condition the minds of the public is broadcast out in the open can i tell you one more thing look guys the bible says from the things that are seen we have an understanding of the things that are not seen i prophesied about iphone 13 many years ago what is the difference between this phone and the other phones no not just the camera before the iphone almost every phone in the market before the first iphone almost every iphone in the market you almost for every phone in the market you can take out the battery when the iphone came and steve insisted that the batteries will not be taken out the children of this world that threw their weight behind him they shot the iphone into prominence it was not the best phone when it came out it was not the processor wasn't great the memory wasn't great the screen wasn't awesome but the reason why they pop they publicly made sure that every one of us got an iphone was because they kept pushing it like if you don't have an iphone you feel like you're second you're a second class citizen and the reason being that if you can't take the battery out it's always on and it's always on you and what did i say after a couple of years i said where we're going is this after a while not only will you not be able to take out the battery you will not be able to turn it off and you will not be able to remove your sim this phone you cannot remove the sim in this phone they have a little dummy space here where you can put a sim of your own it's a joke because the real sim is built in and it's irremovable and you can't turn it off you can turn off the screen but it's always on the battery life has been tripled but you can only still use the same number of hours that you can use because they're saving that extra battery for when they need it and then the other thing that i prophesied that has not happened in this phone that will still happen is that every single one of our phones will connect to these satellites and it might happen as soon as fall of next year okay no no even the Android too <laughs> well played well played alrighty so everything I'm telling you almost everything almost everything that I'm telling you is public information so please don't be afraid for me okay and don't be afraid for yourself because what we're saying is public information I'm just helping you to appropriate it so that you know the kind of battle that we're in let's read on it says the testing of a Russian anti-satellite weapon ASAT this weekend caused a major stare. With no prior warning, a Russian space weapon was launched from the whatever cosmodrome near the Arctic Circle. It traveled 300 miles above the Earth and successfully obliterated a defunct Soviet era spy satellite called Cosmos 1408. The resulting explosion created a cloud of more than 1,000. 500 pieces of what of trackable orbital debris which poses risks to other orbiting bodies such as international space station after the test seven astronauts on board retreated to an emergency vehicle and warned and were warned to take cover keep reading i want to get to the place where he's talking about the impact that this thing is going to have every one of these things have significance but we, we i mean go break it down on your own you know but let's just keep going and we don't support any of these products so disclaimer these whatever they're selling we don't yeah okay all right please let's analyze it later okay we don't have the time let's just keep going straight to the part of it that concerns us now it says now let's keep going Now, this is all of just the details of what is going. Now, stop right there. It was only the fourth time that the satellite has been taken out by a missile. That caught my attention because we have come into the season of force exactly a year ago, standing here. No, maybe not. About a year ago, I was standing here and I said, we have come, we've come into a season of force. And that was when officially the Holy Spirit let us know that we have come into the season of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So these days when you see the number four, it means the completion of the arraignment of destruction. 
Okay, because those four angels are the ones that release the four horsemen of the apocalypse and they're the angels holding the wings of destruction. So when you see the number four, don't expect for there to be a fifth one. The next time anything happens, it's chaos. The test is over. Okay? It is only the fourth time that they're shooting it down and it's all part of a test. But now that the fourth has been hit, the next one is not going to be a test. Now, when you read on, you can go find this article on your own. When you read on, what you will find is that it talks about the fact that this thing is going to affect our communication. It's going to affect a lot of utilities that we enjoy. It will be an excuse to shut things down. Okay? It is only an excuse to shut things down. And what does that mean for you and I? Come with me to Romans chapter 19. Wow, even though we started early today, where has the time gone? Romans 9, 17. Yeah, not 19, 9, sorry, 9, 17. Yes, okay. I want you please to also continue re studying this thing and meditating on it when you get home. What does he say in Romans chapter 9 verse 17? He says, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. The Bible says that the scripture says this concerning who? Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the head of which country or nation? Egypt. Now, one of the things that we've carefully analyzed here over the period of one year specifically about the times that we're in is that the very last system of government that will be on earth before Jesus comes is going to be called what? It's going to be called Egypt and Sodom right and so the head of today's government you might call him or her the antichrist but god sees him as the same spirit called pharaoh okay so the bible says in the last days the last government that will be around that will oppose the son of man or attempt to oppose jesus when he comes which will be the government of the Antichrist, will be a government of Sodom and, I mean, Egypt and Sodom. It's going to be Egypt in terms of its regimentation, but it's going to be Sodom in terms of its immorality. Are we seeing regimentation in the world today? This is the highest order of regimentation that we have seen since Pharaoh and partly since the Romans. And what does that mean? Wherein they can issue one command and every nation follows through. That is regimentation. It takes a lot of military machinery, not just political prowess, to say that we're shutting down the world and to successfully do it. When COVID came, every single nation was shut down. The only places that were not really shut down, we have always known them to be DMZs, to be demilitarized zones, e.g. Switzerland. You know, they weren't really shut down. And that's because of the fact that they're not a nation like everywhere else is a nation. They're almost like, anyway, let me not go into that, but you can just call them a DMC. That's why everybody takes their money there because if any conflict breaks out, you can't touch that money. You see what I mean? And that is the reason why they stayed not shut down because they're different. But when you talk about nations that are nations, nations that take taxes from people as opposed to making money from somewhere else, everything was shut down. Now that is Egypt. That is regimentation. But we also have immorality. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I want you to recognize that what God is saying here about Romans chapter 9 verse 17, in Romans 9 17, about Pharaoh is happening in our world today. The kings of the earth are able to perpetrate what you have just seen and they will succeed in causing chaos in space to bring darkness on the earth 
and it is not so that your lives or our lives can be miserable it is so that we can be reminded of the glory of God this is my submission to you and I may sound like a broken clock now because I've been saying this repeatedly for six months the darkness that is coming upon the earth needs to come so that the glory of the Lord can be seen because God intends for that darkness to allow for there to be contrast between his glory that is upon you and the magic and the sorcery and the enchantment that has gone into the world my favorite example is this the day that I established to you that the darkness of the people is technology was when I said to you if somebody asks you for a thing right now if I just say to you I say Miss Lily how many countries are there in in, in Asia you're not going to try to remember you're just going to google it right because we have come to know that there is light on the palm of our hands what is what is information information is light right and so that's the kind of light that we have become accustomed to if somebody has a headache now or they have some symptoms in their body many people don't ask the holy spirit what is going on with me what is happening in this temple that you inhabit what do we do we go to web empty right you go to the web quickly if you're coughing two times every two minutes what does that mean right the internet has become the light of the people how do we find our way in this world now google maps right and so that darkness that has come is the darkness of the people if that light is not taken away many of us will not know once again how to rely on spiritual navigation by the holy spirit jesus is coming as a thief in the night when the world thinks that there is darkness you will see the light of his coming they will not fail i told you what they will fail at doing on sunday the kings of the earth will fail at one thing in particular and they will fail at relocating us to the mountains around the edge of the earth they planned on it they built them out but god says on sunday that they will not succeed in physically moving us but they will succeed in instrumenting the darkness pharaoh will bring the darkness let's read romans 9 17 again because i think we we're not we're not we're not really catching this drift romans 9 17 says for the scripture says to pharaoh for this purpose i have raised you up that i may show my power in you that my name may be declared in all the earth to show my power in you is to shine my light in the darkness so lastly and we're going to close because i know that you can only preach for so long before people zone out is this that light that God wants to showcase is not on its way is already here he says arise and shine not for your light will come he says for your light is come so what do you do what is your part to play what am I supposed to do, you and I? What are we supposed to do, you and I? Say that again. Pray and fast. We need to do those seven things. Simply because the alarm has gone off, has gone off for us. The Lord gave us a heads up. He says, three weeks, you will see it. What, what else did I say on the day? I said, when it happens, it will be public information and we all we know it you saw what they're saying and there was war where in the heavens that's what the prophecy says and that war has begun and they're not even mincing words they're telling us oh ha that the war has become or as is underway the war is here already and what will be the implication of the war darkness of the people this is a time for us to sharpen our discernment because a lot of the things that we have relied upon will be taken away. Let me say this. I want you to let me wake up the person next to you because I don't want you to miss this. Genesis chapter 17. And I like the fact that 17 keeps occurring in all of the things that we're saying today because 17 is the number of victory. Because in all of these things, we're going to be victorious. Victorious. In fact, let's first of all read Genesis 42. You know, Genesis 42, 17. Did we read that the other day? 
or was it verse 7 that we read? Genesis 42, 17. And we're going to also see. So, Genesis 42, 17 is very short but very powerful. The Bible says, so he put them all together in prison for three days. Okay. <laughs> Let me say this. He put them where? In prison for three days. The children of this world will attempt to put us in prison for three days. Why am I saying that? Everything that happened to Jesus will happen to the church. Jesus guaranteed us that. He said, as they have done to the Son of Man, so shall they do to you. And where was he put? He was put in the belly of the earth for three days. He was in darkness for three days and three nights before the resurrection. So before the church rises, there's going to be three days of darkness. I've already spelled everything out to you. So now you know how long the darkness is going to last for. The darkness will last for three days, but the effect of it will be longer than that on the children of disobedience. But you are prepared. Okay? Now, 17, verse 16. Genesis 17. I'm going to show you one more thing here. The Lord said to me on, on Saturday, I, on, on Sunday, I was excited. I was like, man, God, that was a great party that we had. And the Lord said to me, he said, do you really know what you were celebrating on Sunday? I said, Thanksgiving. <laughs> And then the Lord said to me, he said, what you were really celebrating, he gave me a glimpse. I saw us at Donny's. Sister Gina, I saw us at Donny's, but it wasn't us that was eating rice and, and chicken. Not our physical bodies. I saw our spirit bodies. And we were dancing and rejoicing. You know why? Because our redemption draws near. The part of it that excited me the most when I saw that picture, when I saw the spirit us, it's not how modest we were dressed because most of us were just wearing robes and sashes in the realm of the spirit. But what I saw that made me most excited was this. Now, the robes were not fancy robes. They're gray in color. They're like sackcloth because we're witnesses. That's what we're dressed in as, right? And we carry the mark of the Lord Jesus. So the robes were red. Every single person had a mark of the witness, right? In different colors, but they had a pointer to the truth, okay? So the ones in golden yellow represents the truth. You see what I mean? The sacrifice. Everything was present in what I saw. But you know my joy in what I saw was I thank God. I say, Father, I thank you because your will is done here at Communion House. Because what is the will of God? That we will be ready. And only people who are ready rejoice when, when it's time for war. You know, if you're prepared for war and the battle cry is sounded, you're going to be like, bring it on. Because I've been waiting to use these weapons. I've been waiting to smash the enemy. But if you're not prepared, you would be like, ah, can they give us more time? Or you go into hiding. The communion house that I saw at Donny's on Sunday was rejoicing because the battle cry. I hadn't even heard this news. I saw this one today. As you can see, it's 16th November. But I was rejoicing because of the fact that we know our season, that our time has come. Genesis 17, 16. This is an unusual scripture. Let me warn you before we get into it. Genesis 17, 16. And this is what it says. It says, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. And then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. How many times did he say we bless her? He said, I will bless her. And then he said again that I will bless her. How many times? Two times. Who was blessed two times? The church. Jesus says, in two days, I will prepare my people, and on the third day, I will come for them. This double blessing refers to the two days of preparation, and it says, what shall come out of her? Kings will come out of her. We are the kings. We are kings and priests unto our God. And so the way that I want you to approach all of this thing that is going on is that at the end of the day, when you emerge out of this darkness, you're going to be emerging as kings. How do I know that? The Bible says Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. Do you know that it is dishonorable for a king to go to another person that is not a king and honor them? Because the one you honor, you exalt above yourself. And so when the Bible says through Isaiah that kings will come to the brightness of our shining, they will come to us not as men, but they will come to us as kings. The reason why I said it's a very unusual scripture is because when you read it, you may not think about the fact that it is you that God is talking about. 
but I've come to let you know it is you. So what does this mean? The Lord said to me today, very clearly, after I said it to me, he said, I want you to jump up. This is worth celebrating. And I repented quickly because the Lord reminded me, said, do you know how long you've been wanting to know this thing? And I brought it to you today and you're sitting there. So I got up quickly and I did the dance before the Lord and I celebrated because of the fact that a lot of the things that I've been seeing that don't fit in the world that I'm in, the Lord showed me today. He said, because you've been thinking too small. He said, but now when I showed you how to think, then everything makes sense. Most of us have been thinking about buying land somewhere and start building cities and get away from all this chaos and all of that. And the Lord said to me, he says, you are thinking too small. He said, because I don't just want to give you a piece of land in North Georgia. He says, I want to give you the earth. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. We are kings. We will inherit this place. All of the shenanigan that is going on in the world is helping us to clear the field so that when the darkness comes and goes, we will emerge as kings and we must be ready to take over. Let us break bread. And we're going to review those names. I mean, those um, things, not today. I mean, not now. We can, Pastor Will will sort that out for us. I just, I want us to be able to see and know that truly every hour is represented in there. And then we can celebrate that another time or have a conversation depending on how it goes. <laughs> God is good. Alrighty. So, I'm done reading scriptures to us today, but there's just a lot more that I would like for us to hear. Um, but this one thing I'm actually going to just say very quickly as we stand up to our feet. If we can just rise up to our feet, every single one of us, as we break bread. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. We cannot go back. How many remember, was it three weeks ago that I said that? Right here. And then the Lord is reminding us again today that we have come to a point right now wherein we can't go back. Now, it sounds like, oh, oh, we can't go back. But let me tell you what it means that we cannot go back. The Lord turned back the ones who were not ready. And the ones who were ready did not have to go back. So when the Lord is saying, I brought you to a place where you cannot go back, he's saying many things to you. One of the things that he's saying is he finds you worthy of this calling and election. He finds you worthy. And if the Lord finds you worthy, only you can check yourself out of the system. That was why Jesus says, anyone that lays his hands on the plow and looks back is not fit. He says, do not be of the ones that turn back unto perdition, but, unto the, but be like the ones that press forward unto the saving of the soul. Because remember, Jesus was the one who chose Judas, but he chose to turn unto destruction, unto perdition. So I'm begging you, don't turn back to being prayerless. Don't turn back to being fastless. Don't turn back to not knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. Don't let those little sins get the best of you you are more than that you're a priest unto your god who ministers to your god in righteousness god said to, to cain he says sin is waiting at the door he said but you must resist it if god is saying that you, you must resist it it's because he knows that you can resist it and so every one of those little things that have so easily beset us those things that people will say to us in the past that will get us angry and put us in the flesh and make us start to shake where we're at let nothing shake you anymore but the word of god because if you're so easily shaken you will shake to the tremor of the marching of the hoofs of the enemy and god is like man you're my son why are you shaking you need to stand so right where we're at, we can't go back. Eli, we can't be carnal anymore. We can't be fearful anymore. We can't deny God anymore. We can't be silent when people are saying untruth anymore. No, you don't, no, 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 no. What you said is not true. This is the word of God and just say it. And you're like, oh, but that person is my boss. No, you are the boss of the boss. The Bible says God looked at Moses and said to Moses, you need to put yourself together. He said, because I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. Have you read that in your Bible? God told Moses, he says, I have made you a God. Unto if God makes you a God over Pharaoh, why would you then be afraid of Pharaoh? Right. That's right. Right. Amen. Amen. So a lot of us who are keeping quiet is because we're afraid of Pharaoh. But as far as God is concerned, he's made you a God over that Pharaoh. Fear not. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. For the bread that is your body. We thank you for the wine 
and you may open your wine at this time that is your blood as we eat of your body today and drink of your blood in remembrance of you we celebrate your grace we celebrate the love of the father and we remember it and we appreciate and anticipate more of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit as we break bread today I want us all to say the grace together 2nd Corinthians 13 14 let's go may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore amen you may eat and you may drink in remembrance of him I quoted that scripture because I, I don't want you to keep thinking that the grace was invented by the Pope. It's not the doing of the Catholic Church. It's a scripture in the Word of God. 2 Corinthians, I believe, 13, 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm excited, folks, today at what we experienced in here, wherein we had to go eat upstairs because the presence of God was so mighty and strong. It is not because... Let me put it this way, because when, we, when I came in here and I saw people on, the, on their faces still kneeling down, the Lord said to me, he says, what did you do different today? And I smiled. I said, nothing. He said, yeah. Remember, several months ago, I said it here that things would change, not because we do things different, but just because the time has come. So no man can take this honor unto himself. But because we are found faithful, we've been coming. Even those days that you didn't really feel anything other than the air conditioning. You keep coming. On those days when you couldn't really feel like you got anything of it, out of it other than the mac and cheese, you still kept coming. So God rewards consistency and faithfulness. And so I want to encourage you, finish strong. These are not the times to chicken out. These are not the times to skip out of meetings. Yes, Tuesday next week is Thanksgiving, right? Is that the one? Or is it two weeks time? Tuesday next week, we're not going to be meeting here because of the holiday. But please, be in fellowship one with another. If you're not traveling, hook up with somebody. You understand what I mean? But then if you're traveling, wherever you go, be conscious of the presence of God. But other than that, once we come back on Sunday, let us make that commitment not to skip meetings. Because you just never know when God is going to be revealing and unveiling some new stuff that have been there that you did not know. Alrighty, so I'm going to hand it off to Pastor Will. Let's be seated for one or two more minutes as we take the offering and take some announcements. But it's a new day over the body of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. And there is war in the heavenlies. God bless you. Amen. What a service and what a gathering we've had again today. Well, let this offering basket not fall off the seat. Come on, guys. Let's celebrate what we've received this evening. And you, with being here, I will say I've gotten it hot. Oh, is that now went off? Uh, hot off the press. This will be released at a later date, but I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's at Communion House. Who's subscribed to our YouTube channel, by the way? Okay, good little hands. I would hope so. <laughs> um, good little hands in there. Please, I do encourage you, everything that you hear tonight is available. That was actually how we managed to get that stuff on the screen. Well done, Katie, as well, for helping me do that. Um, Yes, please do celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to do a quick time of tithes and offerings. We're going to leave the offering basket here. If you need an envelope, all pens, etc. are in here. But tithes and offerings, I just want to read this scripture over it. This is the talking about 17s, Pastor Moses. Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. This is Jeremiah 17, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. And he does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And he is not anxious, or she is not anxious, in the year of drought. For it does not cease. They do not cease to bear fruit. That was, I'm just going to be prompt to what the Lord is saying. He says, say nothing else. So, Oh, go ahead. Okay, I was waiting for you. So, these are the ways to give. If you are online and watching us right now, I'll put this screen up as well. It's for you guys to receive it. But please, guys, anybody need me to read anything out? You can all see it. Perfecto, perfect. Anybody need an envelope as well? 
Don't worry, you can do it at the end as well. And our building offering, there are ways that you can give if you want to, I actually want to celebrate everybody who's given to the building fund and offering as well. It has been massive. Thank you that that is above and beyond what you have been doing for tithes and offerings. And I just celebrate it because you're investing in where we are going. Thank you. Thank you for trusting what the Lord has placed in this house. I commend it in Jesus' name. But if there are the ways to give, just make sure, make sure you're putting on the check, building fund. Make sure you're using the different Zelle number, which is 470-429-1305 or communion.house forward slash give. Helpers on watch have their ladies breakfast on 12-4. So this is a bit of advance notice. There is another event as well that I want to talk about. That's at 10 a.m. So make sure to write that down in your diary. And also you can follow us at helpers on watch on Instagram and YouTube. Now, men, if you're in the house, you can encourage your ladies if they're not here to also follow that. There's also a how event um, this Saturday, I believe. Please speak to one of the how ladies as well for more information on that. It will get you plugged in for what that is going to be and what it's going to look like. Last but not least, I want to celebrate all of you who have already began to volunteer and put your name into the volunteer hat. Come on. It is amazing. We know that Chris Ward is going to be our volunteer coordinator, volunteer manager. We've also got Alan, who's almost going to look over the pastoral care of volunteers as well that we want to celebrate. And these are still areas that we're looking for people. Photography, children's ministry, set up and set down front of house greeters. This is planting seeds for where we're going in the future as well. So get in now. That's what I would say. Get in now and be a, a part of this established vision for Christ. But again, thank you for that amazing heart to serve. Okay, I'm going to pray over this offering, but let's be upstanding as well as we do that. If you've given on your phone, I'm going to combo it. I'm going to do this. Um, if you've given on your phone, we're going to pray over that, so please raise it with me. If you've given in any other way, and then we're also going to combo it with the, with the blessing as we head off tonight as well. So Lord Jesus, Lord, I'm thankful for every good gift that you have given us. And Lord, we're just truly returning it back to you. I love what Pastor Moses said earlier on in this service, Lord, that you have given us this 100%. What are we then to question? Oh, hey, this is what I give you back, Lord. So, thank, so I am thankful, Lord, but I pray, Lord, let us be thankful for what you have given us as we sow back in to the kingdom advancement right here on earth. And Lord, as I lay this basket down, I believe that tonight has been a, mag a, a night of magnitude on the Richter scale of the Spirit, Lord Jesus, that you are doing great and mighty things in and amongst us. And I know that people are becoming changed, not shaken in fear, but shaken that they will say, yes, this is the way I should go. This is the way I should hear. This is the way I should see. And I will walk in it, Lord. We're thankful for the ministry and the calling and the heart that you have placed upon our pastors, upon Communion House, and we will march forward faithfully. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, one and all. Thank you, guys. And on Online people, it's great to see you. Lord bless you all. Okay, this is better. Awesome. So, one of these nights, we're going to have a prophetic night. And what I mean by that is, we're just going to share dreams and visions. Because I can almost say that my ears are full. I, I, I hear what God is telling you and what things God is showing you. And I just want to thank God for my own real microphone. This one sounds terrible. Pastor, it's designed for your voice. Okay, put mine back on. Praise God. Yes. So that day is coming very soon. And the reason why I'm announcing it ahead of time is I want you to be prepared to come and be a blessing, right? Let's make it a potluck of prophetic insights, right? Not made up stories Amen. so that you're not feeling like, uh oh, everybody's talking, I need to say something too. But wherein, wherein we genuinely come to say this is what God is showing me. Amen. Put a demand on your, let your spirit put a demand on heaven. Amen. You understand what I mean? I say that because there are people here that are seeing things that are very vivid. That should be everybody. Okay? That should be what? That should be everybody. The Bible says desire the best gifts 
And so if you're not singing here, press in and say, God, I don't have to have been born again since 1976 to see things. Because it's not about longevity. Okay? I know that people say that longevity is not legality. In some cases, it is. But not in all cases. When it comes to being able to see, you don't need longevity. Okay? You don't have to have been saved since the spring of 84. You may have just rededicated your life to Christ. Or maybe now you're just beginning to see that. You know what? Spiritual gifts are available. I want to press in too. So I'm giving you a heads up. It will be by the grace of God in a few weeks. It's not going to be a Tuesday. It's not going to be a Sunday. It's going to be a totally different day. And we're just going to come in here. And everyone will come up and share. All right? Is that, some, is that going to be cool? Do you think that's good stuff? Yes. Oh, yeah. Because a lot of what is being said here, I just read your message again that you sent at 11.06, which is also 17, about the fact that God is showing him that there is a release of, you know, the hordes of, of evil. And I'm like, yeah, that's what they were talking about, the war in the heavens. So there's a lot more that we're going to be doing when we come together in this melting pot of prophetic insights. Alrighty, So that's it. Just get ready. God bless you. Brother Bryson.